Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's my absolute pleasure to be able to share my research with you. My name is Jennifer Marshman. I'm a PhD candidate at Wilfrid Laurier University with the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. And along with being a geographer, I'm also a registered nurse. Uh, it sometimes surprises people that I'm doing a PhD in human geography. But one thing that I hope you take away from today is how interconnected we all are, not only to each other, but also to the complex and diverse ecosystems that we live in. And bringing a truly interdisciplinary lens to my research has been an invaluable tool for me. The Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems is also the home of Handpicked Podcast and the UNESCO Chair on Food, Biodiversity and Sustainability Studies. The Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems conducts research and supports initiatives focused on fair, environmentally regenerative, circular and diverse food systems. There's a lot of great information on the website about the center, the podcast, and the most recent notes from the chair. So I'm not a plant biologist or an entomologist, although learning about different species and their interactions is a very fortunate side effect of the work that I do. I may also slow things down a little bit when we go for walks because I do things like this. I like to take photos of bees, bugs, and flowers, and I don't necessarily move very quickly because lots of things catch my eye. But this is a tiny flower with a tiny fly on it, which is completely adorable. Or so I think. So as a social scientist, I study the human or social aspects of pollinator conservation, meaning that I'm interested in how we interact with pollinators and how these interactions impact things like conservation policy, food security, and also very relevant at the moment, hope for the future. So this is a bit of a blueprint for today's talk. I'll be talking about why bees matter, some of the important ways that bees contribute to our quality of life. And I'll be talking about one specific initiative called Bee City. Of course, there's many ways to engage with issue, issues of pollinator conservation and education. I'll be introducing you to the Bee City movement, and I'll talk a bit about my research on this movement. So because this isn't a live lecture, we can't do a chat box for questions, but I welcome all your questions, concerns, comments, anytime. My contact information will be provided at the end of the session. And if there's one thing that I've learned from a PhD, it's how much there is to learn all the time. And so I am firmly in the no stupid questions camp. Unless of course, it's in the syllabus. No, we don't have a syllabus for this talk. So any and all questions, comments, uh, or concerns are very welcome. So I'd like to start off with an impressive number and that is 20,000. There's an estimated 20,000 bee species found globally, which is nearly the same number as all the mammal and bird species combined. And there are about 4,000 found in North America, a few of which you can see here. So this amazing poster usually attracts a lot of attention at events that I go to. Uh, you can see that I have a copy of it right here behind me. Uh, it shows some of the incredible diversity of bee species that we have in North America alone. Uh, there's different sizes, shapes, colors. These bees are all to scale to each other. So you can really see how most bees may not look the way you expect them to look. And this is only the bees that have been discovered and named. We are still a long way away from a comprehensive list and we're still discovering and identifying new species all the time. So here's an example sitting on my thumb. This is one of the gorgeous little bees that we have here in southwestern Ontario, which is considered a biodiversity hotspot for bees with about 420 different identified species. So this is a green sweat bee. You can see the taxonomic name here. This is the official bee of the city of Toronto. Who knew that, that cities would have official bees? Uh, many bees will defend their nests even against other bees of their own species. Apparently this little bee is very welcoming of other bees, probably because more bees means better protection at the nest. So here in Waterloo Region, our pollinator working groups are working on an official bee as well. So stay tuned for more news about that. So this gorgeous bee has that lovely metallic sheen. It's a very common bee here. 
And a while back, uh, I was touring the university campus with my students and I was talking about the campus as a pollinator habitat. And this little bee clearly wanted to let us know that there are many nesting spots and opportunities for nesting spots all over campus if you look closely enough. So you can tell that I love bees uh, and you know that I take lots of photos of bees and bugs and I'm probably a little bit slow to go for a hike with because every little critter catches my eye. And I know that some of you may be wondering also how a registered nurse and a human geography gets interested in bees of all things. So it's not as much of a stretch as you might think. You may have heard that bees are in trouble but contrary to messaging from popular media, the bees with the highest risk of extinction are not the honeybees, but the wild bees that are native to North America, of which more than half are in decline and one in four at risk of extinction. We know a lot about honeybees who benefit from extensive global breeding programs because of their important role in the agro-industrial food system. The European honeybee is the most widely managed bee on earth it's only one of those 20,000 species that I mentioned, and yet historically, they're the only species that are used for risk assessments for agricultural pesticide use. And this leaves huge gaps in our understanding of how other bees are impacted by these activities. Remember just how diverse bees are, not only in their sizes and colors, but also in where they live, what they eat, and how they interact with their environment. So while honeybees are easier to study due to their portability and large numbers in constructed hives, we still know very little about most of the wild bee species that are native to North America and mostly solitary. Even so, many best management practices emphasize interventions that are geared specifically towards managed honeybees with recommendations that favor the easy mobility of their hives while the native bee species are left behind living, eating, and nesting in the places where the honeybees have been removed for things like pesticide application. An estimated 90% of flowering plants on earth depend on insect pollination, and bees do most of that biotic pollination. Flowering plants provide myriad benefits, including aesthetic and cultural value, there's educational and hands-on learning opportunities, such as those found in schoolyard gardens. And there's therapeutic benefits, such as those offered by hospital and long-term care gardens and horticultural therapy programs. There's a growing body of literature on the health and well-being benefits of contact with nature, much of which is dependent on pollinators for reproduction and aesthetic value. Experts from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is a mouthful, it's often just called IPBES, they released a report called Nature's Contributions to People, which builds on the concept of ecosystem services. So for any of you who may not be familiar with the term ecosystem services, it was popularized by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report in 2005, and it refers to the many benefits that humans receive from the natural environment and ecosystems. The Millennium Report categorized ecosystem services into provisioning services, such as food, water, and timber. Regulating services that affect climate, air and water quality, and things like floods. Cultural services that provide deep cultural meaning, recreation, and beauty and supporting services, which includes building soils, photosynthesis, and nutrient cycling. Some conservationists and policymakers like the term ecosystem services because it seems that valuing nature for nature itself has failed to provide adequate protections against the many ecological crises that we're now experiencing. The extent and degree of human-induced change on the planet is significant enough to have placed us in a new geological age, the Anthropocene. In 2016, the International Commission on Stratigraphy, which is the keeper of our geological timescale, agreed that the concept of the Anthropocene, the human epoch, is geologically real and of sufficient scale to be considered part of our geological timescale. So you can see here the different parts of our geological timescale some of which you've likely heard of, like Jurassic, 
and you can see how the Anthropocene fits into this time scale. One of the things that this tells us is that most of the biosphere, or all of our planetary ecosystems, have been altered by human activity. And in fact, there is no part of the biosphere untouched by human influence due to the impacts of global climate change, which is one of the defining features of the Anthropocene. As part of these changes, we're currently in what is being called the sixth mass extinction. The last mass extinction event happened about 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period, killing all the non-avian non dinosaurs. Another defining feature of the Anthropocene is that the main cause of the mass extic extinction event we are currently facing, this is not a random or passive event. It is largely the direct result of human activity. Defaunation. This is the loss of wildlife populations and species extinctions. And of particular concern in Earth's defaunation is the decline in health and in numbers of pollinating insects. The main causes of these declines are habitat fragmentation and loss from urbanization and agriculture and exposure to pesticides, pathogens, and parasites. So along with the change in range of certain pathogens and parasites, a changing global climate is also causing some of the problems, some problems that are phenological in nature, which means that timing of flowering plants and pollinator emergence in the spring is disrupted. Habitat ranges are also disrupted. There was a study done in 2015 that showed that in Europe and North America, bumblebee species are not tracking warming trends northward and are losing their southern range limits, and so their ranges are decreasing. One of the reasons that I became interested in studying our relationship with bees is because of their critical contributions to our daily lives, including nutritious diets. So as a food systems researcher, I've studied various forms of urban agriculture, urban food provisioning like gleaning, and urban own growing like backyard vegetable gardens. Pollinators play a unique and as I said, critical role in our lives by pollinating an estimated 35% of global crop volume. So this is where that one in three mouthfuls of your food is thanks to a pollinator comes from that you may have heard. It's not entirely accurate to say one in three mouthfuls, but it does help us to understand the significant role of bees. So while there are other species that provide pollination services such as flies, wasps, beetles, and even bats, although not in Canada, bees do most of the heavy lifting, providing about 70% of that pollination. And some of them, like this gorgeous common eastern bumblebee, or Bombus impatiens, do something really special called buzz pollination, which I'll show you in a moment. So this fuzzy bee that most of us are familiar with is a social bumblebee, although very different from honeybees, and it will live in colonies of up to 500 bees. This is actually pretty unusual for bees. Most bees are solitary, meaning that they don't live in colonies, and most bees also don't live in hives or cavities, most of them nest in the ground. For the common eastern uh, bumblebee, only the queen will survive the winter and emerge in the spring. So you may start seeing them now, especially uh, after that gorgeous weekend that we just had, um, as they emerge and start foraging and looking for a place to nest. It's a really critical time of year for her because she needs to find enough food for herself as well as her developing offspring. So this is where adding early blooming shrubs and trees to your yard can really help support bumblebee colony health and other bees as well. So while we're admiring her, let's have a quick look at that buzz pollination that I mentioned. Sonication or buzz pollination uh, allows some bees to get pollen from flowers that have very small openings uh, for pollen to escape. A few examples of agricultural crops that benefit from this buzz pollination include blueberries, cranberries, kiwis, chili peppers, eggplants, and tomatoes. It's some of our native bee species that have this ability. The European honeybee, Apis mellifera, does not have this ability and has been shown to be a poor pollinator of these types of food crops. So this is just a short 
video of a bumblebee doing some sonication. Hope you can hear that. So when we think about the role of bees, it's easy to think about the dietary impacts of declining pollinator populations. Pollinators are a key ingredient for urban agriculture activities globally. There are more than 800 million people practicing urban agriculture, and this number is growing. In regions that are already vulnerable to nutrient deficiencies, a lack of pollination could further exacerbate de deficiencies in vitamin A, iron, and folate. Micronutrient deficiencies, also called hidden hunger, can prevent people from thriving and cause irreversible health effects. There are currently an estimated 2 billion people suffering from hidden hunger globally, including wealthy people and people with obesity, because micronutrient deficiencies are not just an issue of undernutrition and are a known consequence of an industrialized and highly processed diet. So this is one of my uh, favorite bees. This is the hoary squash bee, uh, Pepinopis prunosa. It's the most important pollinator of cultivated crops of squash, pumpkins, and related plants. A squash crop with a healthy population of squash bees can be completely pollinated without artificially introducing any honeybees. If you grow squash in your yard or garden, in the afternoon, once the flowers have all closed up, you can peek inside and like this photo uh, from our garden, you may find a male or an unmated female squash bee sleeping inside. Okay, so the plants that we're talking about are the pollinator dependent plants, which contain more than 90% of vitamin C, 100% of lycopene, and almost all of the antioxidants, B cryptoxanthin and B tycopherol, the majority of the lipid, vitamin A and related carotenoids, calcium, fluoride, and a large portion of our folic acid. All these numbers tell us is that declines in pollinator populations could result in a significant increase in preventable diseases that are linked to nutritious diets, and particularly in populations that are already vulnerable to nutrient deficiencies. So I think that many of us would agree that there's more to pollinators than their economic value. But in terms of farming and livelihoods and the benefits that we get from bees, some of those ecosystem services that I talked about, it can be an important indicator. So these kinds of economic valuations are used to help motivate certain kinds of pollinator protections, particularly those geared to honeybees or commercially managed bees. Fortunately, many, but not all, of the activities that help honeybees are also good for native bee species, such as planting a diversity of flowering native plants that bloom throughout the growing season. Globally, pollination has an estimated market value of up to 577 billion US dollars a year. Without these biotic pollinating services, Changes to crop production could cause increased food prices for consumers and losses for producers. A future with compromised pollination due to a lack of pollinating insects points to an increased need for pollination by hand, which is already necessary in some places. The labor costs involved with hand pollination, as you can imagine, are potentially significant estimated at 90 billion per year in the United States alone. This potential increase in, in the cost of food production could mean an increase in food prices, creating a new form of food elitism where only the people who can afford the increased cost of food can afford to eat those foods. Given that affordable food is already an issue for many people living in poverty, this could only exacerbate an already significant barrier to nutritious and sufficient diets. Producers or farmers are also consumers or eaters, and there are already crops that these farmers cannot afford to eat themselves, even though they are growing these crops. The market price makes them inaccessible. A lack of pollinating insects could also similarly worsen these conditions. 
Like hand pollination, this is not hypothetical. This is already happening in some places. Okay, so this presentation is supposed to be about changing the doomsday narrative. And I seem to be giving you lots of bad news so far. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about Bee City. So there's lots of campaigns and initiatives that acknowledge the importance of bees and other pollinators. And the one that we'll be looking at today is Bee City. So I don't mean Bee City or obesity. Both of these have caused a little bit of confusion and various conversations that I've had about my research. I mean this bee city. So the bee city movement began in the United States in 2012 in Asheville, North Carolina, led by bee advocate Phyllis Stiles, with the help of members of the Buncombe County chapter of the North Carolina State Beekeeping Association. Phyllis had an inspired vision for native pollinator conservation. And in June 2018, Bee City USA joined the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, which is an international nonprofit that protects the natural world through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. In 2016, environmentalist Shelley Candle championed the Bee City movement here in Canada. After approaching several organizations to take ownership of the Bee City brand, Candle decided to move the initiative forward herself with the City of Toronto, making Toronto the first bee city in Canada. The timing was opportune because Toronto was launching their pollinator protection strategy at that time, which was created to support diverse pollinator communities that contribute to resilient ecosystems and enhance urban biodiversity. This is an excellent resource and I highly recommend that you check it out if you haven't already. This was also the time that Toronto adopted the green sweat bee that we saw earlier as their official bee. So Toronto really led the way for the Canadian bee city movement. And today there are 39 designated bee cities and 51 bee schools, including colleges and universities across the country, including our very own Wilfrid Laurier University. Bee cities are as far west as Tiquet, British Columbia, as far east as Campbellton, New Brunswick, as far north as Airdrie, Alberta, and all the way down to Niagara Falls, Ontario. The application to uh, process to become a bee city has municipalities, townships, and First Nations communities signing a resolution with local government or leadership and applying to Bee City Canada for the designation. Now, Neither Bee City USA or Bee City Canada has ever turned down an applicant. This has been met with some criticism. How meaningful can a designation be if anybody can get it? Leadership from both organizations see weak applications as important learning opportunities and that less experienced or knowledgeable Bee Cities can learn from others with more knowledge or experience. Bee City can act as a catalyst for knowledge dissemination, awareness building, and especially networking, and can compel, compel municipalities into action in ways that center environmental concerns. The name itself epitomizes and animates inclusivity by sharing a collective municipal identity with non-human nature, even if and when priorities differ. It's a unique approach to raising awareness for pollinators because it brings together paid officials with local citizens to educate, create habitat, and celebrate pollinators. These are the criteria for becoming a bee city, and applications demonstrate how these criteria will or are being met. While appearances may suggest an air of silliness or lightheartedness in the process, for example, this is a photo of the city of Guelph's mayor, Cam Guthrie, speaking at an event in his bee costume. All applications must go through their respective municipal or band councils for approval. So embedding a conservation strategy for bees at the municipal or council level can help provide legitimacy to activities that may be perceived as fringe or undesirable, 
such as urban space naturalization. It's also unique because of the urban emphasis. Cities propelled by the bee city movement can provide an important refuge for bees from rural spaces as they currently exist, where there's extensive use of agrochemicals, and that may be dominated by large swaths of agricultural crops that do not require insect pollination. Because of agricultural activity and rapid urbanization, rural spaces increasingly do not contain the diversity of flowering plants that benefit bees and other pollinators. So historically, urban conservation has focused on education and outreach rather than on habitat. We're learning more all the time of the value that urban spaces can provide for pollinating insects and often pollinator friendly action is well aligned with overall sustainability efforts. For example, growing food in residential yards, community gardens and other urban spaces is an alternative to turf grass and can provide a source of fresh foods, enhance physical activity, and reduce overall stress in gardeners. Urban agriculture can provide important ecosystem services, including an increase in both plant and animal diversity, climate control, and less overall impervious services, which helps to reduce stormwater runoff and flooding. A variety of plant species can help support a diversity of pollinators who in turn pollinate the plants that provide food and resources for other animals and help create beautiful urban spaces. It can also help, help to increase food crop yields. So by providing more pollinator friendly flowering plants early in the season, you could see more and better quality fruits and vegetables later in the season. Okay, so this is a good time, I think, to share another backyard pollinator photo. This is a side-by-side -side to show you a red belted bumblebee and a bee mimic. So on the right is actually a fly. The easiest way to tell the difference simply by looking at them are the eyes and the uh, antennae. So on the fly on the right, you can see very small sort of stubby antennae and very large eyes that cover most of the head, which is different from the bee with longer antennae and eyes that are located more on the sides of the head. Depending on the position, you might also be able to see two wings on the fly versus four on the bee. So I've been researching the Bee City Movement since 2017 and I helped develop and organize their first ever pollinator summit in September 2018, which was attended by over 100 people, including 23 bee cities, four bee campuses, including Wilfrid Laurier, the University of Guelph, Fleming College, and Western University. Also attended by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and several organizations including Wildlife Preservation Canada, Pollinator Partnership, the Ontario Greenbelt Foundation, and Hydro One. Many of the attendees came to the summit to learn more about what Bee City means and has to offer. Along with participant observation, surveys, and document analysis, I conducted a multi-site collective case study of Bee City Canada and affiliates in Ontario. Interviews took place between October 2018 and July 2019 with Bee City board members, volunteers, and municipal staff, and ranged in length from half an hour to two hours. 17 of the 18 Bee Cities that were in Ontario at that time participated in the research. Interview participants were asked about motivations for becoming a Bee City, perspectives on the need for such a program, barriers and facilitators to implementation of their programs, details about their working groups, project goals and sustainability, champions within their program, and overall Bee City plan. There's a summary of the Pollinator Summit available on the Bee City Canada blog on their website, as well as a list of all the Bee City Canada affiliates across the country. One of the first things that I noticed was that even though there are specific criteria for becoming a bee city, so just as a reminder, the criteria are creating habitat, educating about and celebrating pollinators. 
the way that those criteria are enacted is determined at the local level with each municipal affiliate making their own decisions. A B city designation is not just a name, it's an action oriented designation and buy in happens in many different ways. So for example, there are B cities like the city of Kitchener who use the B city designation to help propel pollinator friendly initiatives across the city on municipal property, such as urban green space naturalization, creating pollinator meadows in underutilized park spaces, and reduction of grass mowing on municipal property. Something really uh, exciting happened in our region in the fall when the region of Waterloo, which is made up of three cities and four townships, became Canada's first B region. And it will provide support for the three designated B cities of Kitchener, Waterloo, and Wellesley Township. With the designation, the region has committed to encouraging municipal staff to maintain pesticide-free pesticide pollinator habitat on municipal property, including on land owned by the Waterloo Region Airport. The region also supports many large and small scale pollinator friendly projects, including this pollinator patch that you see here, which is located at the intersection of a large urban green space, schoolyard and hydro cut. Another example is in Niagara Falls, Ontario. Municipal staff and advocates worked hard to implement their plan that combines a green burial project with a two acre wildflower meadow in one of their largest urban cemeteries. This pollinator park has over 10,000 pollinator plants and educational signage to help guide people through the space. Before Bee City was a glimmer in anyone's eye, Pollination Guelph's flagship project turned a decommissioned land landfill site into a pollinator meadow with the goal of being one of the largest pollinator initiatives in Ontario. This was outlined in their application to be City Canada, signed off by Municipal Council and Mayor Cam Guthrie. This was no easy feat because landfill sites are under very strict regulations for safe use. Efforts were led by the nonprofit organization Pollination Guelph, uh, who has been a leader in pollination, uh, pollinator initiatives for nearly two decades. This group has been acting in a primarily local context, limited mostly by human and financial resources to extend their reach. They were one of the first groups to identify that a national organization was needed to help motivate and organize urban pollinator conservation efforts. In their 2020 B City renewal, they said that the B City the B City status helped draw public support and media attention for projects. Not all B Cities have animated such large projects, but they have helped to raise the profile of pollinators in their respective locations. Many municipal staff are completely on board with much needed pollinator friendly initiatives. But there's often still some pushback um, from uh, <clears throat> based on some feedback from uh, urban residents, especially about naturalized yard maintenance and urban green space mowing. Some people still prefer the manicured lawn, which is the dominant landscape in North American cities and property maintenance bylaws still largely ref reflect this standard. Since the Bee City movement is still relatively new and growing in Canada, it remains to be seen what, if any, impacts this movement will have on things like bylaws and creating new norms for property maintenance. So as I mentioned earlier, cities can provide an important ecological landscape for pollinators. In particular, the trend of restricting the use of cosmetic pesticides in urban areas. So as of 2015, seven Canadian provinces have restricted some or all pesticides for use in private residential yards, and an eighth allows only federally approved biopesticides. Pesticide regulations in Canada begin at the federal level under the Pest Control Products Act, and uh, 
and uh, act and regulations, excuse me, provinces and territories can further inhibit or restrict any pesticide and cities and other municipalities are responsible for corresponding or further restricting bylaws and enforcing those bylaws. The Bee City movement in Canada is timely given the changing use of pesticides in residential yards, especially for those bee cities that are focused on private or residential properties as sites for pollinator habitat. Unfortunately, while the total use of pesticides and fertilizers is lower now than in the 1990s, residential use of pesticides and fertilizers has been increasing in recent years. With the growing evidence of the dangers of pesticides to pollinator health, adopting a bee city strategy that emphasizes pollinator health provides an important platform to provide education about the dangers of many pesticides and their alternatives. Because pesticides are linked to pollinator declines, this is potentially a focal point for municipalities in creating their bee city programs. My research highlights how the multiple and diverse benefits of bee cities and care for pollinators are enacted and the value that this provides. Bee cities create a network of interconnected municipal entities, practically and conceptually joined by the common designation of bee city. Membership in social networks provides benefits and resources that are not necessarily gained without access to those networks. Sustainable stewardship activities are more likely to last and be successful when social capital is high. Social capital is the relationships between people that create a shared sense of identity and shared norms and values. Many municipalities see the benefits of being part of a network and many of them have joined other initiatives as well, such as the Blue Dot Movement through the David Suzuki Foundation and others. Some Bee City volunteers identified the importance of being part of something bigger, being part of a movement. Municipalities all come to the Bee City, all come to Bee City Canada with different wants, needs, and expectations. But the former communications director of Bee City Canada said that one thing they all have in common is that they want to be recognized. They want to be recognized as communities that are concerned and are acting to make positive change. Along with sharing knowledge and celebrating successes, networking and coming together as a collective of bee cities supports a new realization or a new animation of the concept of community. Bee cities can tap into the knowledge and experience of other bee cities. And one of the ways that this is happening is through something called buzz webinars. Lots of puns with, with bee information. So these are hosted by individuals, organizations, or municipal bee city groups to share information through the bee city network on specific topics of interest or expertise. Past webinars have included things like conservation in the Canadian context, the magic of soil, Toronto's pollinator protection strategy, and leveraging resources for habitat creation. One of the strengths of the Bee City Initiative is that it meets designates where they are, where they are with their physical spaces, their level of knowledge, and their available resources. While critics caution that this could potentially harm, not help pollinators with the spread of misinformation or misguided activities, such as the introduction of urban hobbyist beehives, Meeting Bee Cities where they are is an important part of how Bee City Canada operates. This place-based, context-specific way of welcoming municipalities under the Bee City Canada umbrella fosters a community of learning rather than a hierarchy, working on the premise that implemented good is better than planned perfection. This approach also makes the program more accessible to small and rural communities whose populations and priorities, such as farming, may be significantly different from larger urban centers. <clears throat> this is also true of communities who value a highly manicured or, or ornamental plant aesthetic in their yards, gardens, and municipal green spaces that may act in effect as food deserts for pollinating insects 
but in themselves be a significant part of the municipal identity. One B City volunteer who was instrumental in getting the designation in her, munis in her municipality said that it's important to support conventional farmers' efforts and livelihoods, including the current government approved practices of herbicide and pesticide use, and they plan their Bee City projects without alienating those farmers. In cases like these, an all or nothing approach benefits no one, and instead people are invited to start where they are. Navigating the complexities of Bee City Canada offers municipalities the opportunity to engage in conservation efforts by starting where they are and building on a network of Bee Cities across the country. While the depth or breadth of individual Bee City programs may not be enough on their own to create comprehensive systemic change, these programs can act as a launching point for awareness building and as a platform for highlighting important initiatives that may otherwise be overlooked. So if you aren't sure if your city is a bee city, check out the Bee City Canada website under current bee cities. Under the resources tab, you can find many of the past buzz webinars that have taken place. They're also all posted on Bee City Canada's YouTube page. So I'm going to sign off with some final thoughts, uh, three things that you can personally do to help pollinators. Takeaway one, think about actions that you can do to contribute to pollination conservation. For example, if you can, plant a diversity of flowering plants that bloom throughout the growing season. If you can, Donate time or money to conservation organizations. Contact policymakers at local, provincial, territorial, and national levels to express your concern and voice the need for governmental funding and support for native pollinator conservation. If you're already doing these things, keep doing them. Takeaway two. Whenever possible, support your local small-scale organic farmers, who are producing food in ways that promote ecological integrity and regeneration. There was a time when organic food was considered a passing elitist fad. A 2017 Statistics Canada survey indicates that 76% of Canadian consumers now purchase organic fruits and vegetables, and the organic sector is now worth more than $5.4 billion in retail sales in Canada. And so, no action is too small to contribute to a growing movement. Takeaway three, think outside your box of Honey Nut Cheerios and learn all about the diversity of native bees in your area. Protecting these bees is important for everyone, not only for the ecosystem services that they provide for free, but also to help protect the integrity of our terrestrial ecosystems on which all life on earth relies. If you're already doing these things, keep learning and connecting with the environment and all its inhabitants. We are all part of this biotic community that we live in, not separate from it. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, if you're the kind of person that uh, likes to think and reflect, you may want to take a few minutes before doing the next thing that you have planned and maybe write a short reflection on your thoughts uh, if that's something that you would find useful to do. Thank you so much again for tuning in. It's been my pleasure to share some of my work with you. Uh, please don't hesitate to be in touch. My contact information is here for you along with a list of resources. So thanks very much and take care. <laughs>